Absolutely. So I'm just going to begin with a, a bit of an introduction, and we'll start like this. So good evening. My name is Neil Orlovsky, and I'm the Director of Education and the Chair of Global Education with the Abraham Global Peace Initiative. On behalf of AGPI, we want to welcome back those who've joined us for previous speaker series events. And to those attending for the first time, we hope that tonight's engagement will be educational, but I would say even more so, would motivate you to speak out, to stand up, and to take action in order to combat all forms of hate, injustice, and intolerance in Canada. I want to begin like this, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, anti-Black racism, anti-Brown, anti-Asian, anti-Indigenous and anti-FNMI, and anti-2S LGBTQ plus racism. More and more isms are making the news, and yet it seems like things in our society are, are not becoming more inclusive as they become more diverse. So one of the questions I wanna begin with as we turn over the presentation is what measures, what might we be taking or putting into place in order to create community? So the Abraham Global Peace Initiative has set out to assist, encourage, and promote the advancement of human knowledge and understanding through the study of and research into international human rights, fundamental freedoms, democracy, global peace, and civil society. Now, there is no doubt that hate in our cities, in our province, our country, and within the larger world, that hate and hate-motivated crimes seemingly are on the rise. And further, it seems that our communities are becoming islands, which at times seem at war with each other. So again, what can we do about this and how did this come to be? So tonight's discussion on the contours and consequences, anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic hate, crime in Ontario and Quebec, is a discussion on the troubling rise of anti-Semitism in Canada. While sadly, we are not joined tonight by study co-author Dr. Barbara Perry, who's the director of the Center on Hate, Bias, and Extremism, we are pleased to welcome co-authors Dr. Matthew Stein, director of the Social Research Center, and Irina Levitt, who was a research assistant on this study, who all collectively examined the experiences of anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic, sorry, anti-Semitic hate crime in Ontario and Quebec, and by focusing on Canada's largest academic work on the subject today, they explored how the nature and the extent of experiences of anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic hate crimes, perceptions of trends of anti-Semitism, reporting practices and satisfaction, and personal and community impacts of anti-Semitism have adapted to incorporate modern conspiracy theories, including those around the pandemic. So with that, I would like you to join me in welcoming Dr. Matthew Stein and Irene Levitt. Thank you so much. And <clears throat> thank you very much to the Abraham Global Peace Initiative for hosting this event. I'm um, very grateful to be here and uh, presenting this work that we've uh, been doing for the past I don't know, it feels, it feels because of the pandemic like we've been doing this forever, but uh, something to the effect of uh, two plus years now that we've been working on this. Um, I, as, as mentioned before, I'm a co-investigator on this study with Dr. Barb Perry. I'll sort of go through our team in a couple of slides, but before we get into uh, what it is we did, a little bit of context and background as to what anti-Semitism looks like in Canada. These are some quotes uh, from uh, primary media. So in Edmonton, frankly horrifying hate crime, uh, a hate crimes unit investigates uh, graf uh, swastikas and graffiti. No longer feeling safe in the city, a uh, Vancouver man has an alleged hate motivated assault. Jews are our dogs, uh, an anti-Semitic chant that was uh, made at a Mississauga rally. Vehicles being spray, spray painted with swastikas, racist slurs, and uh, Nazis Zoom bombing uh, meetings with hateful messages. And unfortunately, what we're seeing, this is before the study that we did. And everything that we found in, this, in our research study furthered these points and 
gave us plenty of additional examples of anti-Semitism in Canada, specifically in Ontario and Quebec. So looking at anti-Semitism in the broad spectrum of hate crimes, as you can see from this chart, and this is a Statistics Canada chart, you can see that from 2016 to 2019, um, hate crimes that are motivated specifically by religion, Jews are disproportionately re represented. You saw, you can see that in 2017, uh, there was a dramatic spike in Muslim-based uh, hate crimes that almost brought it on par with uh, hate crimes directed towards Jews. But this essentially deviated, this uh, went back down to the mean and Jewish hate crimes still um, maintained consistent. So what essentially we did moving forward is uh, Dr. Barb Perry and I, uh, uh, Dr. Perry is the director of the Center on Hate Bias and Extremism and is a world expert on hate crime. Uh, she came to me with this idea of uh, using our joint capacity of our research centers um, that she would bring sort of the knowledge of hate crimes in the criminology background and I would bring some of the knowledge of the Jewish community and the Jewish experience. And between the two of us, we could form this team that would be able to combine our expertise, our knowledge and interests uh, in applying for uh, and eventually being successful in applying for a Shirk Insight Development Grant, uh, which is Shirk, for those of you who don't know, is a social sciences and humanities research council. It is one of the three largest um, federally funded uh, research agencies in Canada. It's called a part of the Tri Council. And we were uh, lucky enough to receive the first federal funding to explore issues of anti Semitism in Ontario and Quebec. Um, and then, as fortune would have it, uh, Irina was uh, TAing for me at the time and was one of our um, both incredibly capable and also uh, having background knowledge in Judaism and an understanding of that. It was a fortunate. A uh, combination and confluence of factors that Irina was able to join our team and has been with us throughout her master's and is now going on to um, work on her PhD at York University. So that's a little bit about our team. Now about what we did. We took two approaches to study anti-Semitism in Ontario and in Quebec and essentially what we'll do throughout this presentation, it'll be relatively divided down the middle. On one hand, we did a quantitative based survey with some elements of open ended questions where we um, attempted to get into the Jewish community as much as we possibly can to have as many people fill out a survey, uh, this survey that we developed about their experiences with anti Semitism. And in developing the survey we went through, we combed the existing data that existed out there. Uh, in terms of other surveys that have been completed, other non-academic works, which is the majority of the work that's been completed, and tried to develop a survey that was as academic as possible, that had the rigor um, that we felt it needed to explore the, to do this initial foundational work within anti-Semitism. Um, so we'll have an, a series of, of areas that we, we discuss within the survey. First, I always feel it's important to review some of the demographics. We had, um, Irina, do you know the total number? Was it five, was 540 the number, the total sample? Um, it ranged depending on the question, but yeah. between uh, 480 to um, about 500 and 80, uh, sorry, 560. 560, yeah, yeah. That, that, makes, that makes sense. So, the, and it really does range on the question because we uh, aren't forcing any responses, but that's the approximate sample that we're dealing with uh, for the survey aspect. Irina 
midway through, we'll talk about the qualitative follow-up interviews that we did both with some members who completed the survey and wanted to share more about their experiences and other, we targeted some community leaders uh, to try to make sure that we got uh, some of their unique experiences. So some things to note about some of our demographics. There was a reasonably uh, even split in gender, slightly uh, inclined towards male participants. The city of residence was, was dominated by Toronto, but that also makes sense. This study was hosted through Toronto, Montreal, Ottawa, Hamilton, Kitchener, Waterloo, and London. Now, something to note in terms of our recruitment, started this all with the best of intentions and then the pandemic happened. Um, so one of our main recruitment avenues was going to be through synagogues and community centers. And basically this was at the beginning of the pandemic. So while we extended our survey recruitment, we didn't have a number of the avenues of recruitment that we usually would have had uh, because people weren't congregating in the usual areas that they would. Going back to the city of residence, um, Toronto was dominant, then Montreal. And then what's interesting is Ottawa had a significant representation and then there was a, quite a drop off with Hamilton, London, and then finally Kitchener and Waterloo. It, I think it is reasonably representative, representative of the nature of the Jewish population in Ontario and Quebec. But that being said, obviously we would want as many participants from each of the target cities as we possibly could. In terms of the age range, um, to the best of our ability, we tried to specifically target and make sure that we filled as much as many possible responses from each of the different age groups. That being said, we are heavily represented in the over 60 age group. Uh, if you'll notice the 18 to 24 is a little bit larger um, relative to 25 to 30, and that was uh, concerted efforts on our parts, particularly IRENA, in trying to reach out to different university, college, and, and uh, youth-based organizations to make sure that we got uh, both ends of the spectrum in terms of the experiences uh, of anti-Semitism. Oh, too far. <clears throat> there we go. In terms of denomination of Judaism, the highest representation uh, was in the conservative uh, population, uh, but also we had a very high representation of cultural Judaism or non-religious. Um, what's interesting, and th this plays into this in the next question, in terms of uh, markers of Jewish identity, this was reflected in the fact that the largest uh, marker of Jewish identity by, an, very, by not a small margin was uh, people who were wearing Magen Davids um, or a Star of David necklace. Following this was a kippah, but we did not see, uh, because of the slightly smaller representation of the Orthodox population, we didn't see nearly as much of those uh, outward markers of Jewish identity. And I, I believe this will play a factor later on in the results. So some context for anti-Semitism. Um, what we see and what's interesting about the results of the study is we see a lot of historical tropes and concepts that are repeating themselves in, and starting to come up again in modern day society. Um, and, and this was something that was quite staggering to me. And some of it I, I anticipated, some of it I didn't. Um, as again, as as a member of the population, while I'm and and Irina, I'm sure you could say the same thing. Um, and hopefully, I'm speaking accurately for you. I, I found it staggering to hear some of the things that others have faced in terms of anti-Semitism. People asking where are your horns. Um, people in in classrooms being uh, mentioning that they killed Christ or whatever it may be. And, and really most commonly having pennies and other forms of coin thrown at them or dropped specifically to play up on the trope, uh, the historical trope of Jews with money. But also one of the most 
common context for anti-Semitism is in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, where in something one's belief starts with anti-Israel sentiments, and this eventually translates and morphs, and not even really eventually, I should say very quickly, translates and morphs into anti-Semitism. A lot of the people, a lot of the interview participants that we ended up speaking to said, something to the effect of, I'm okay if you critique Israel politically, but it's when you cross that line and go into a, st into a form of anti-Semitism, that's the problem. And defining where that line, in, line is can be incredibly challenging. Also, and, and as was mentioned um, in the introduction, a lot of conspiracy theories uh, still exists about Jews. Uh, first of all, that Jews are the root of all that's wrong in the world, that we, uh, these forms of power and authority, and we are this guiding hand in the background of things. And, and these are these false beliefs that people are taking on and using, uh, using as the foundation of anti-Semitism. But also more recently, uh, there are, are a fair number of beliefs that uh, COVID itself was some sort of Jewish plot to take over additional control over the world. The, uh, I remember that one of the uh, participants said something to the effect of someone believed that Jews created COVID so that Israel could develop the vaccine or had already developed the vaccine and could therefore profit by having this vaccine be um, effect be needed throughout the world because created the problem and the solution. Obviously, this is insane, but this is these are the beliefs. Moving forward, some of the trends of anti-Semitism in Canada, and I think this is one of the more staggering statistics that we found. The perception is 55% of all of our participants believe that anti-Semitism is increasing significantly in Canada, and 34% believe that it's increasing to a minor extent. If you add that together, 89% of participants believe that anti-Semitism is increasing at least to some extent. This is a frightening statistic because regardless of what else we find, the state of anti-Semitism in Canada is, is just increasing. And it is not a uh, safe place as a result for, for Jews to feel comfortable um, in, I, in forming that identity. Interesting, uh, some fascinating primary problem areas of anti-Semitism in Canada um, predominantly, we're seeing anti-Semitism online at 90% as being the biggest problem of anti-Semitism. And we're seeing this a lot in social media, um, responses to news articles, thing, online news articles, things of that nature. We're also seeing a number of extremist groups, and this is followed by graffiti, the number of examples of uh, swastikas being painted on houses, cemeteries, community centers, whatever it may be, is sadly increasing. But then we're also seeing at 71% a significant amount of anti-Semitism in the media, such that there are biased representations of Jews, of uh, global situations, such that we're seeing it in the media and it is filtering downwards. Uh, to others who are sharing those perspectives and views. In terms of personal experiences of anti-Semitism, thankfully, the largest percentage of our population had no experience with anti-Semitism at 45%. That being said, a lot of people face some form of verbal harassment. Um, a number of people, 15% uh, face online harassment, and thankfully only 5% had some sort of physical attack. That being said, some interesting things to unpack within this um, these statistics, verbal harassment, and, and this is a little bit of a tease in the qualitative data, whenever I found that I spoke to a participant or I interviewed a participant, they might start off by saying, no, I didn't really have any experience with anti-Semitism. And then as we continue to do the interview, they would say, oh, wait, now that you mention it, 
I've had so and so and so and so experience. And oftentimes these were in the form of microaggressions or, or something relatively minor, but they were still anti Semitic, verbally harassing or online harassing experiences that we we tend to sort of slough off. So that that's one of the interesting things in the self-reporting of the personal experiences of anti-Semitism. I think that no experience category, while it does tell us something quite interesting, I, I feel as though there may be um, some question in my mind, especially when we look at overall some overall statistics and trends and things like that of not reporting or uh, having an incident uh, occurring and then just sort of letting it slip our mind or, or not making as big of a deal of it as it probably deserves. In terms of reporting, anti-Semitism, and this goes along the same lines, anti-Semitism is heavily underreported. Uh, we found that 83% of uh, respondents who faced some form of anti-Semitism didn't report these incidents to police or any relevant authorities. Either they didn't think it was, it warranted any form of reporting, they forgot about it, and then when they went, when it really started to bother them, too much time had passed. They didn't think at the time to report. Oftentimes there are elements of power dynamics, and we see this particularly in anti-Semitism on campus, or even anti-Semitism in the workplace, wherein a uh, superior might make an anti-Semitic comment, but the uh, worker uh, or, or didn't feel as though they had enough uh, power within their organization to actually report and do anything about it, or didn't believe that reporting would actually lead to anything positive. And a lot of times also we've we've found incidents that have happened to others and was reported by others or it happened in a group and someone else within a group happened to report it. What's also interesting in the in the lines of reporting is that a, oh, two thirds of our, our participants who did report found the response from police and authorities to be insufficient. And some of the common areas of dissatisfaction were lack of response or follow-up. Um, if a report was made particularly to police, it was very difficult to translate that into an arrest or any kind of conviction or anything tangible to come out of it. And also if reported to social media, there were times where the post may have been taken down, but other times there were discussions of freedom of speech or not within their service policies or whatever it may be that uh, hate speech was allowed to main, to uh, stay on these platforms. Also of note is that community leaders are more likely to report uh, satisfaction and a positive relationship with police services, something that Irina will unpack further on in the qualitative section of the analysis. In terms of anti-Semitism in the community, 64% uh, of respondents indicated that some form of anti-Semitism has occurred in their community. And it tended to make uh, participants feel frustrated, concerned, vulnerable, uh, fearful, isolated, or threatened. And a lot of those uh, emotional responses to anti-Semitism will be discussed further further in the qualitative section to unpack some of the direct quote, quotes from some of the participants to really understand what is behind uh, those emotions of how one feels after anti-Semitism occurs in their community. In terms of anti-Semitism on campus, we found um, approximately one third of our participants were affiliated, who were affiliated with post-secondary institution being either a student, a staff member, or a professor, experienced some sort of anti-Semitic incident on campus. Incidents were primarily student-to-student -student interactions, uh, public events and protests, and posters and displays. While this is not inherently a positive thing to see the silver lining in this, the power dynamics of uh, professor student interactions were not necessarily as significantly represented in the overall spectrum of this. That being said, when we heard stories uh, through the qualitative interviews of 
uh, professors and students having anti-Semitic interactions, these anti-Semitic interactions often blew up to significant extents and really had a, a fairly negative impact on the students. Uh, more than half of the respondents in post-secondary indicated that they did not report the incidents. Those who did report, 80% did not find the incident to be handled appropriately with a little action being taken. And particularly, I think as we went through the interviews on anti-Semitism on campus, we found that there was more and more dissatisfaction with uh, university administration uh, and um, individuals of authority in university to address uh, concepts of anti-Semitism and how it made Jewish students on campus feel. So can, moving forward, um, I'd now like to pass uh, the floor over to Irina, who's going to talk about the personal impacts of anti-Semitism and then go through the qualitative responses that we found. Hi, everybody again. Um, so I'll close off some of the survey findings before I head off into the qualitative findings. And I'd like to close off with a personal impact of anti-Semitism from our survey results. We asked participants um, a question um, if they had modified their life at all as a result of either having an anti-Semitic incident happen to them, having witnessed an anti-Semitic incident, or having friends or family um, experience an anti-Semitic incident. And what we found based on our survey results was that the sort of vast majority of individuals reported that they did not modify their life at all as a result of experiencing or witnessing an anti-Semitic incident. And this is something that we'll unpack a little bit more in the qualitative findings because we feel that sort of as we've gone through the interview process, a lot of times what participants um, report as not having modified their life at all, um, you know, turns out to be that they have just in ways that may not be entirely conscious, um, may not be entirely voluntary. And so that might not be something that comes up as they're um, completing the survey. Um, so some of the things that we've found from the online survey was the ways in which um, participants modified their life. So the vast majority of participants, if they reported modifying their life, said that they hide or they no longer wear markers of Jewish identity. So this could be sort of tucking your Magen David into your shirt before you go on campus. They might be more cautious about divulging their Jewish identity. So they might not... Uh, they might choose not to divulge that they are Jewish, whether that's in uh, a workplace or whether that's on campus. Uh, they might also decide to, for example, not speak Hebrew in a public setting so that it doesn't sort of give away um, their Jewish identity. And <clears throat> we've also found that participants were more in it likely to be vigilant about their surroundings, being more careful about where they go, who they go with, what kind of activities they participate in. And for a very sort of small minority of individuals, um, experiencing anti-Semitism in whatever form actually made them more vocal about their Jewish identity and made them um, want to participate more, made them want to advocate more. So before we go into um, some of the personal impacts that we've found um, in our interviews, I just wanted to sort of touch on um, a little bit of the numbers about the interviews. So we interviewed just under 60 people. 24 of those were um, community leaders. So those would be rabbis um, or uh, members of um, a sort of community organizations. Um, and we interviewed um, 34 participants of the sort of general Jewish community. And again, we interviewed individuals um, uh, across Ontario and Quebec. So I'll go into some of the uh, findings, some of the themes that have come up through our interviews. So the first thing that's really um, prevalent 
through our interviews was this underlying idea of fear. And this fear had a couple of elements to it. First, that um, a, a fear of escalating violence, a fear that um, another Holocaust would occur. And this was especially prevalent in um, interviews with participants, in, uh, with older participants. We also found that fear was frequently um, connected or associated with additional feelings of confusion and vulnerability. So feelings that they're no longer safe in the community, feelings that they're no longer safe to express their Jewish identity, um, that there's less places, um, less physical spaces and less online spaces where it would be safe to divulge that you're Jewish. Um, and particularly, we also found, you know, significant uh, fear among participants uh, that are on campus. So this fear has prevented some individuals from engaging in community organizations because they don't want to out themselves um, as being Jewish on campus for fear of repercussions. And we've seen, so I've left some um, quotes from some of our participants, and we see that in some of these quotes, um, some participants have experienced um, harassment, um, and in some cases, physical attacks when they were on campus. And so these experiences have uh, instilled um, uh, some fear in them. Um, and witnessing these experiences has also instilled fear to the um, consequence that they don't feel comfortable comfortable divulging their Jewish identity or expressing their Jewish identity on campus. Okay, so the next sort of thing that I a theme that I want to talk about is this idea of isolation and alienation that has come across through our interviews. And when I say isolation and alienation, I mean it in sort of two contexts. So there's isolation and alienation of um, individual Jews, um, and they feel an increased distance, um, or they feel farther away, not as connected um, from their Jewish identity. And that really uh, sort of culminates in um, them not participating or a hesitancy to participate in Jewish customs and community events. And another way that we see this isolation and alienation coming through is this distance or divide between Jews and non-Jews in the community. And this um, really came through in a couple of different contexts, specifically the workplace and on campus. So within the workplace, um, participants certainly felt isolated and alienated when they experienced anti-Semitism. But they also felt alienated and isolated when um, the structure of the workplace did not consider um, their faith or their Judaism. So many times they felt isolated um, because they weren't able to participate that, uh, in events that occurred during Shabbat, or they weren't able to participate in team building events that didn't consider their needs for, um, a, kosher, uh, for a kosher diet. We also see this isolation and alienation play out on uh, university and college campuses. So um, uh, sort of going back to that um, fear and the um, sort of hesitancy to express their Jewish identity, um, this has also modified their behavior in the sense that they um, feel they can't participate in political and social life on campus. So a lot of the participants that we spoke with um, said this sort of particular sentiment, and I'm paraphrasing here that um, I just want to go to school and get an education. I don't want to have to defend my identity or my existence when I'm on campus. And this is something that very much came um, uh, that came up for a lot of participants that um, are Jewish and that um, go to university. Okay, so going back to um, the idea of Jewish identity and sort of behavior modification, 
um, a very predominant, very uh, prevalent sort of theme that we found in our interviews, also in our survey, was this idea of having to minimize or hide your Jewish identity. And this need that people felt to sort of not out to themselves or not divulge themselves as being Jewish comes across through um, a number of different contexts. It happens in the workplace, it happens in public, it happens online, it happens in the home, it happens in um, a participant's individual self-expression of Jewish identity, and of course it happens online as well. And so some of these things that we've found included um, or ways of minimizing or hiding Jewish identity included not disclosing that they're Jewish to co-workers or to other students, um, not disclosing that they're Jewish within a classroom, not speaking Hebrew in public so as not to out yourself as Jewish, um, not engaging with Jewish organizations, whether it's on campus or outside of campus, um, uh, not wearing markers of Jewish identity. So for example, not wearing um, a kippah outside of the home or tucking in your Magen David when you leave the house. Uh, some participants even removed the mezuzah from uh, their door frame so that uh, the public um, wouldn't know that you know, those participants are Jewish um, and where their address is and where their location is. Um, another thing that we found when we spoke with community leaders was along the sort of idea of minimizing or hiding your Jewish identity, uh, many rabbis we spoke with said that there's been an increased disconnect between Jews and Jewish identity. And it makes it, um, and there's been less engagement and uh, participation in Jewish customs and in um, Jewish traditions, participating in synagogue. And some of the participants that we spoke with said that part of the reason that they've been hiding or minimizing their Jewish identities because they don't want to be defined by the um, uh, rampant anti-Semitism that they've been experiencing. So going along, um, uh, sort of expanding on that behavioral change, minimizing and hiding your, uh, their Jewish identity was certainly a big behavioral change that many participants reported doing. And again, when we asked them if they've modified their life in any way, many times they um, actually said no. But in discussing the sort of anti-Semitic incidents that they have experienced or heard, some of these things came up as sort of triggered memories, or some of these things, uh, some of these behavioral changes um, were communicated, were expressed, but they didn't see it as modifying their life. So in some of these cases, this would mean not going to certain places. So not going to protests, um, not going to synagogue, not going to areas where there's large gatherings of Jews, so as not to be um, sort of a target. Some uh, participants went so far as to arm themselves um, and get licensed for carrying uh, weapons. But the largest change, was, uh, behavioral change, was online. So uh, people changed their social media, changed what posts that um, what posts they're posting on their social media. They've deleted social media or deleted so certain posts. They're not going to specific web pages so that they don't have to see the anti-Semitic vitriol that they experience. Um, and they've amended their social media in other ways. And we found this um, especially for uh, participants who have um, specific public facing professions. So they didn't want to become targets um, of anti-Semitism uh, in their professional lives. And they didn't want to be defined um, by anti-Semitism. So I mentioned that for a small minority of participants um, in the survey and also in the interviews, experiencing anti-Semitism, reading about anti-Semitism, um, having uh, witnessed anti-Semitism actually led to um, an increase in advocacy. And a lot of times what these participants 
participants said was that the isolation or the alienation that they felt fueled um, a form of resistance. It strengthened their Jewish identity and it actually made them want to participate more in Jewish events. It wanted to, it made them want to participate more in um, advocacy for, um, uh, you know, the fight against anti-Semitism or for Israel. Okay. And uh, one of the other ways that individuals modified their behavior um, was through heightened vigilance. So this sort of manifested in an increased awareness of a potential safety risk. So always being on the lookout for where the exits are in a particular event or location, or thinking carefully about which events or locations might end in anti-Semitism or might end in violence, and then making a decision whether or not they want to go to those places or participate in those events. Okay, so especially when we interviewed um, rabbis, uh, but also community leaders in general was, uh, this idea of an increased need for security in synagogues. So because of uh, escalating anti-Semitism, because of increasing anti-Semitism, and especially because of international incidents of you know, physical attacks on anti-Semitism, there's also been a parallel increased um, need for security in synagogue. So a lot of these community leaders recognized um, the need to protect or prevent anti-Semitism or at the very least the need to um, put into place a certain security measures to make themselves less of a target. <clears throat> Sorry, and this includes things like having security guards and some of these security guards are paid for year round. Some of them are present during um, high holidays, um, sort of installing cameras, installing additional locking mechanisms, um, requiring members uh, memberships uh, to synagogues for entry in order to be able to verify identities of the people that are coming and going. And then sort of in the context of the pandemic, there's also been an increased need for security online. Um, so the need to incorporate waiting rooms or the need to incorporate passwords um, for Zoom or online events. A lot of the um, community leaders that we interviewed also sort of expressed a sense of unfairness or imbalance that other faiths or that other community organizations don't have to do this, don't have to, you know, provide so much security, don't have to worry about this kind of threat. And they also spoke and expressed that um, this created a financial hardship for them and it diverted resources from necessary community programs into security. I also wanted to mention that, um, you know, in contrast to participants um, who uh, reported having a very low satisfaction rate with police uh, action, community leaders, when we spoke with them, actually reported a good relationship with police and they were quite satisfied with the police response. And we think this might partly be um, due to the fact that, you know, there's usually an ongoing relationships, uh, an ongoing relationship between community leaders and police services. So there's um, a ongoing communication um, between community leaders, between synagogues and police services, even in times of um, peace, even in times where there, uh, there are no sort of, there is no need for uh, police to come in and investigate to something. Okay, so the last thing that I kind of wanted to talk about was um, we had asked participants and community leaders what they think could be done to prevent or slow anti-Semitism from increasing in Canada. And by and large, these sort of five things came up time and time again um, in our uh, interviews um, with both community leaders um, and general participants. And, and so the first two things are kind of connected with each other, education and public awareness. And these two things are interconnected. 
and um, community leaders and participants both said that there needs to be more education um, around anti-Semitism, what is anti-Semitism, what isn't anti-Semitism. Um, there needs to be more education on the Holocaust and public awareness of the impacts of that. Uh, but a lot of participants and community leaders also said that um, you know, in order for anti-Semitism to slow or to decrease, we also have to provide education and public awareness on the positive aspects of Judaism. So um, understanding um, Judaism as a whole, understanding traditions, understanding some of the customs that come with that. So that um, as one of the participants said, um, that we're not sort of defining our identity or ourselves by anti-Semitism, that there's a lot of wonderful aspects to Judaism and it's, um, uh, and it's more helpful to define by the positive aspects of Judaism instead of by the negative aspects of anti-Semitism. So the, these ideas of education and public awareness um, really need to be incorporated, you know, not just towards the public, but they need to be incorporated in curriculums. And again, not just in university curriculums, but many um, community leaders said that we need to incorporate um, this education into high schools, into um, into our public school system. We also need to be able to educate and bring awareness to um, sort of administrations and workplaces. Um, so within the context of universities, we need to be able to educate administration. We need to be able to educate professors and teachers. Um, and then also we need to be able to enforce the law. And what I mean by enforcement, um, I don't just mean sort of enforcing uh, or police enforcement, um, police investigation. I also mean enforcing within companies. So enforcing by the HR department, enforcement by university administration, enforcement especially by um, social media platforms, because they do bear a large brunt of the responsibility um, for sort of allowing um, hate speech to um, continue to propagate on their platforms. Um, in terms of legislation and pro uh, policy, again, they spoke about um, in including the policy on uh, combating anti-Semitism within a large variety of contexts, so within the workplace, within um, uh, educational institutions, so within uh, the school boards, within university administration, having policies on anti-Semitism, um, and some participants um, said that there needs to be consistency in how we define anti-Semitism. So there uh, needs to be sort of uh, an adoption of the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism within these corporations, within these institutions. And then finally, um, participants spoke about political and institutional leadership. And specifically, they spoke about naming uh, or the responsibility of leaders, again, whether that's political leaders, community leaders, um, university leaders, whether that's in workplace leaders, um, the need for leaders to name and condemn anti-Semitism when it happens, the need to uh, for leaders to enforce consequences and to reach out to affected communities. And that's it for us. Um, and we'd be certainly very happy to take any questions that anybody has. Thank you very much. So I'm just gonna turn the chat feature on so hopefully mm -hmm. we'll be able to see it. Um, I'm gonna get the ball rolling. I've got a, a few questions that hopefully you'll be able to answer. And I, I apologize if they come off with a little hard hitting. I'm, I'm being told that over and over. Um, so one of the earliest slides I saw when you were looking at the 2016 to 2019 numbers um, and, and the, the bars, if we look at hate crimes amongst the Jewish population, 2016, we had the lowest, then it incrementally went up 2017, 2018, and then a significant fall in 2019. Mm -hmm. um, 
do you know why that might have been, or can you account for that? Here we go. I'm, my memory's a little foggy. I, <laughs> I think I can account more for 2016 to 2018 than I can for 2019. I think okay. 2016 to 2018, my guess would be a bit of a response. I think we saw a response in Canada to what was um, to what was going on in the States. So I, I think you saw that sharp rise occur that way. 2019, it didn't drop down lower than 2016 levels. So I think it's it's more of a leveling off. My guess would be if we were to see 2020, it would it would um, pop back up again because of the pandemic. But even still, as we're seeing this. It, it, it never drops below the levels in 2016. So that would be my hypothesis. But again, it's not necessarily based on evidence. And even the 2016 numbers is still over 200 incidents. Right, and, and keep in mind, these are police reported and specifically as indicated as motivated by religion, which mm -hmm. that in and of itself I think is likely minimized. I, I and and this is where um, we originally had a slide using the Benaperth audit, yeah. and those numbers are significantly higher. But there are also elements of like report how it's reported, how everything like that. So it's it's just the issue with all of this is, uh, and it goes back to the concepts of reporting, how things are reported, uh, how things are measured. Uh, in terms of anti-Semitism. And, and if I can just throw a caveat with that, and I have my notes here, is using Section 78 of the Criminal Code of Canada, between 2007 and 2017, so this is the Criminal Code section that speaks particularly about hate-motivated crime, there were only 48 instances in 10 years of, of um, hate under the C criminal code of Canada. So I guess the next question is, are you hoping that the study could be used? So Canada does not actually have a standalone section in our charter on hate crime. It defines hate, it defines propaganda, but it doesn't define hate crime. Um, and that's why, like I said, hate report crime only was counted 48 times in 10 years right. under the criminal code. Um, do you see your study hopefully being used as a tool to pass legislation? I know, Irina, that was one of the last um, pieces you spoke about, is I would actually hope that legislation would be the number one. And then it goes to, as an educator, uh, coming down from there. Yeah, certainly, you know, legislation is something that we're aiming for or that we, um, we hope could be affected. Um, we do want to also um, consider the effects of uh, not just like a top down approach where, you know, legislation dictates sort of what is and isn't appropriate. Um, a lot of times what um, discrimination or racism in general requires um, is more of a cultural shift or a shift in um, understanding what's acceptable behavior and what isn't acceptable behavior. If it just comes from the top down, then I think in a way we're risking um, this idea that um, a that our behavior is being policed by the state, as opposed to there being more of a shift in um, norms and values of what's considered uh, appropriate or acceptable behavior, or being sensitive or being understanding um, of other people's um, cultures, of other people's beliefs and values. Mm -hmm. I, I, to add on to that, I, I also think that in terms of the legislation, I agree with Irina completely, um, but I think in terms of the legislation and the political aspect of it, I think it's a very positive sign that Canada uh, and uh, particularly Prime Minister Trudeau doubled down recently yeah. in Malmo, Sweden, and uh, uh, made the uh, special envelope position on anti-Semitism uh, to be a permanent position. And we were lucky enough to have uh, Erwin Kotler uh, be the guest speaker at our last 
uh, webinar and he spoke a bit to this and I, I think his focus still is primarily in that realm of education, but the fact that he will be able to liaise with uh, other um, legislators, uh, politicians, uh, people of that nature could get the ball rolling um, in terms of legislation. I, I personally, I, I rank them, I rank education as being, at least in my perspective, uh, slightly higher than legislation. That being said, I think they're both equally important. Yeah, they sort of do go hand in hand. Um, I just want to open it up to the floor. If anybody has any questions, again, either unmute yourself or feel free to type it into the chat. Give people a moment to get their thoughts down here. I know that I had asked my own students um, and some of which are here tonight. So thank you very much. I've written down your names. You know, when a student comes crying to a teacher saying that the other kids called um, her a vampire or wanted to see her horns, which are two instances my own kids heard in the, in the um, schoolyard. How might we respond to identifying or even our own ability to, to mitigate or to dismantle historical and anti-Semitic tropes. I don't expect, you know, you two to answer because it's not really the study, but that's something, you know, I want to leave with my own students, right? You know, sometimes these anti-Semitic tropes are so, I'm going to use the term off the wall just because I'm, I can't imagine being called a vampire, but it plays into this whole, you know, blah, liable and, and those tropes or the idea of horns and so on but it's the normalization of anti-Semitism, which I think is the most worrisome. And, and I, I, think to, I think to sort of touch on that, I think part of the, part of the issue that we see with anti-Semitism is that because Jews are predominantly white, essentially, anti-Semitism becomes that much more normalized. Mm -hmm. And there is an othering that occurs um, but it's also something where you can't, it, it becomes difficult to say something about it because you are seen as essentially white. You're seen as yeah. the rest of the population. And when, like, uh, for example, I, and not something I want to go into too much depth, but I, I was recently faced um, in my doctoral work, some anti anti-Semitism that was directed towards me. And my supervisor, my committee couldn't understand, couldn't wrap their head around it because they're like, oh, you're in a position of privilege. They automatically assume that I'm in a position of privilege and authority because I'm Jewish without really knowing my background, without knowing. I think, yes. Right. I was just going to say, and that I think becomes part of the difficulty with fighting anti-Semitism is especially with the rise of calls for white supremacy or white fragility it's hard to distinguish that me as a white individual, and I'm going to use the edu babble of white, cis, normative, male, you know, all that. It's hard to be seen as an oppressed body. But on the flip side, you know, it's almost a double whammy when it becomes a Mizrahi or a Sephardic Jew who may, in fact, be of darker skin or, in fact, black where they're, they're encountering racism. And I know that um, Toronto Police Services, and I was pulling up their study prior, actually does categorize anti-Jewish hate as Jewish black hate, Jewish hate, Jewish. And it would be interesting then to see, to go deeper into the study, especially when we're looking at um, chart seven here, is how these numbers break down. And then within certain ethnic groups, like can we break down the Ashkenazi normativity of anti-Semitism. And what's interesting- That's a whole other study. <laughs> that's, that's a whole other study, but but one thing that we did, fail, we did find, and Irina, I'm wondering if you'll re remember this. It was an interview that I did, but if you'll remember this from the transcripts, one of the interviews we did with one of the community leaders mentioned that a member of their population uh, was black. And mm -hmm. they're like, I, ha I have no place to turn. I, I get anti-Semitism 
from outside of the community and racism. And then within the community itself, there's the additional element of racism because I am black within that community. And it was heartbreaking because it's just the, for that subset within the population, the fact that there's that much less of a safe harbor right. makes these, these issues that much more challenging mm -hmm. and that much more upsetting. And another um, sort of element to that that I wanted to touch on that um, we saw in some of the interviews with participants and with community leaders um, and sort of connected to some of these tropes and some of the stereotypes around um, Jewish people, um, around their intelligence, around the sort of, you know, um, their wealth. Um, and a lot of times what ends up happening is anti-Semitism is sort of normalized or it's dismissed because Jews are considered to be sort of wealthy or Jews are considered to be um, upper class. So there's also this class element as well, or this sort of stereo stereotype of class where, you know, it, it can't be anti-Semitism because Jews are privileged. Now, that being said, also, interestingly, in the study, and we didn't share this statistic, I think the overwhelming majority, we also asked about education and household income. Education was incredibly high. The Jewish population is very well educated. Um, and also household income in general was fairly high. But that being said, there were still quite a large percentage of our population that still was not necessarily what I would define to be upper class and wealthy. So there, there are these normalizations of these historical tropes and concepts, but there's a lack of understanding. And, and I think this is a problem in general that we're seeing with our society currently is that we're painting with a very broad brush. Mm -hmm. and and just capturing as much as we can within that within those broad strokes and and that's that's ultimately a challenge any questions from the audience i've got a million questions here because this is my my own passion project um i'd be curious to see and again i know that the questions i'm asking are not directed to your study but almost like more inquiry points uh, with your study looking at Ontario and Quebec, I'm wondering how much consideration was given to kind of the small town Jew, um, where you might see, for example, in some communities, and we've encountered this within our own organization, where you may be the only Jew in town. Uh, so, for example, in Cobaconk or in Smiths Falls or in Kempville, where sometimes, and I know there was a slide between Jewishness and Jewish, I believe it was Jewish identity, right? It would be interesting then to see whether or not this data or rather the manifestations of anti-Semitism might be seen as the same if I'm born into a religion as opposed to living a religion, if, if you know what I mean. I do, and, and I think, I, 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 again, I'm, I'm- Without looking fully... at your sample size. But I, I, I sample size, sample size is the quantitative aspect of that yeah. is where the study isn't able to hit as well. But it's also to the point of we we face more challenges with recruitment than I would have liked. Um, I think we just hit a number of brick walls politically and based on timing. But I think the qualitative aspect of the study is where some of this shines through. Again, it's a single person's uh, representation, but they were talking about um, the experience of growing up in Unionville. So they were adjacent to Toronto, but they were growing up in Unionville I, I think in the 70s or 80s or something like that, back when that was essentially a small town and far enough away from Toronto. And the challenges of having the Jewish and all of these concepts of killing Christ, horns, uh, all that was predominant in their schools, not only with the student in elementary school and high school, not only with other students, but with their teachers as well. And um, the fact that I, I th I'm inferring based on knowledge of a transcript that I read once or twice, um, there, there was this feeling of 
the, when they would go and talk to their parents about it, their parents are like, okay, you just got to sort of live with it and deal with it because we're in a small town. There, there's nothing we can do about it. We are Jews. There's nothing we can change about it. We're not moving. Right. You just sort of have to live with it. Um, but at the same time, also having one's Jewish identity being in a smaller town, it, 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 you don't have the, the safety and security of, of community of a synagogue. The same can also be said to a degree recently with COVID, I, I would say, with, with our community being really shifted to our home base environments. And when anti-Semitic incidents are happening during COVID, it's not like you have the safety and comfort of a community of the same level of community to go to, to have that feeling of strength in numbers and, and to really bolster one's identity. And I think that third point here on this slide, there's a real lack of understanding and support in the school district and the school I've been in. We do have teachers that are part of our educational advisory committee who teach at Mark Garneau. And that's the school that uh, a week and a half ago had a protest uh, the Free Palestine. We have students that, sorry, teachers on our committee that teach in, you know, high densely, I'm going to use the term Muslim by religion, communities that will not publicize to anybody uh, that they're Jewish out of fear, whether maybe to them or to their property. And so this idea within the school district, and I'm thinking of a number of articles that have come out from TDSB, particularly about opposing narratives, um, multiple meanings uh, of history and what that does in the dilution of, you know, anti-Semitism, where it plays into the normalization of it. Um, so the next question, really, I think my last question is, what are your hopes as the next step for this study? And where do you see it going? Irina, do you want to do you want to start with this, or do you want me to take this? Um, why don't you go ahead? Um, okay, that's fine. I figuring I, stuff out in my head. <laughs> I believe I've I've always believed. I I believe that this what we've done is a positive first step, mm -hmm. but I believe it to be very much a first step. I believe that we there was one thing that, that, in my opinion, was missing off of that slide in terms of ways to tackle and approach anti-Semitism. And I am fully showing my bias here. I believe that the primary way, well, the primary way, one of the ways, not the primary way, but one of the ways is increased research. I think that we need to continue, as you've talked about some of these ideas of approaching anti-Semitism, uh, within specific communities and such and, and subgroups and things like that, I think we need to be able to do that. I think we need to be able to continue to do more work, but also have rigorous academic research that is done on a frequent basis to supplement the uh, work that's done on that, uh, on that table we showed earlier in the study to really paint the narrative of what's going on within the community. But I think alongside that, I think the community itself needs to be empowered um, and also to empower research, education, all of those different things in order to allow this to happen. I think one of the challenges that we face, and a lot of it had to do with COVID, is that the community wasn't always the wind at our back. Um, in terms of really pushing forward this agenda uh, of really understanding these issues with a level of depth and thoughtfulness. And, and the fact that, uh, and Irina can speak to this, there's so little academic work that exists out there, specifically in Canada, but in the world in general, in terms of work being done on anti-Semitism. And given the fact that anti-Semitism is so uh, predominant in terms of hate crimes and everything like that. I, I strongly believe that we need more research and more research leads to more targeted interventions like education, like awareness, like legislation. And we just need to continue to work towards developing this cycle of understanding what the issue is, trying to find solutions to those, 
implementing the solutions, testing the solutions, and revisiting did it address the problem and seeing where the problem exists and continue to go. Because this is, in my opinion, this is not a problem that's going anywhere anytime soon. It hasn't gone anywhere for, what are we in, 5,000? What, what's, what's the Jewish year now? 5,007 something right now, whatever it is. Someone can help us out there, yeah. I, um, 57 something. 5770 something, I feel like. Um, it's been a while since I've been in Jewish day school, so I, I don't have the year off the top of my head. Um, but I, I we've been dealing with anti-Semitism for many years. And, and I think in the politicization of um, our current society, I, I, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. And unfortunately, we have an excessive amount of uh, hatred that exists, and we just need to constantly be thinking about it and addressing it. So we do have a question from one of our um, audience members. I'm just going to read it out loud here, and I've just added a couple of other resources. So it is in the chat. Can you comment on anything related to the issue at the University of Toronto regarding the law school hiring controversy and the subsequent CAUT censure and the comments by the president of the University of Toronto Faculty Association, did this come up at all in your uh, presentation, your project? And for those of you unaware, um, CAUT is the Canadian Association of University Teachers. I posted a link there from their website on just sort of if you want to familiarize yourself with that. Did any of this come up in your project? Uh, very subtly, if anything. There was, there was certainly... Um, I'll say this, and 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 I apologize because I know at least we have a handful of people from York in the room. Um, generally, in terms of Toronto and universities in Toronto and anti-Semitism and anti-Jewish attitudes, York is generally, from what I've understood, to be very much at the top of the list. I would tend to say U of T right now is giving York a run for its money. Um, and I found at least from what uh, in the interviews that I read uh, from the experiences of participants at U of T, it is um, a far from a pleasant place for Jewish students at U of T as well. I don't think we've really got anything within Ryerson. In terms of the uh, law school hiring uh, controversy, controversy, we didn't hear anything specifically about the law school hiring, but we did hear of similar stories of professors in, I wanna say medical school, and I don't know if you remember. There was one in medical school and there was another at a social science department at another university. I feel like there was also one though in like engineering or science as well. Uh, there, was a, there was a longer story that I can't, re I can't really remember, but there was uh, definitely one in medical school where there was, it wasn't it nearly it wasn't nearly to the extent of what happened with this hiring of uh, this professor um, and that wasn't mentioned but there was under there were undertones of um, administration uh, and the faculty association at U of T being very unsupportive of issues of anti-semitism um, and when being brought forward with evidence and concepts like what's going on, this was just, it was generally swept under the rug. And same thing uh, said about York. And if I recall correctly, and again, those who went go to York would be more familiar with this. I feel like there was something that had to do with uh, education. Um, there, there was a report being done by someone external and education to be done about anti-Semitism and they brought in an organization or something like that um, on one of the Jewish high holidays that was, it's a, it, ultimately, Fairly recently. Yeah. That, that was recently. Yeah. I, I basically, the long and the short of it is from what we're, what we saw in the study, there are very few safe places uh, in terms of universities for uh, Jewish students. That being said, Toronto seems to be a bit of an epicenter of that. We, we didn't, unfortunately, we didn't have as many people from other universities in like Waterloo or McMaster, or Western. We had one in Western, 
Um, and there was discussion of running for student council and, and anti-Semitism that they face in terms of that. Uh, but there, to answer the direct question, there was not much of a direct mention, but there were undertones. Um, and just sort of to add on to that, there was a couple of sort of um, incidents that were um, discussed that were that didn't have to do with the law school, but did have to do with the um, graduate students association yeah. using um, tuition fees or using the graduate student association fees to sort of uh, fund or to support um, uh, anti-Israel organizations and BDS movements. Yeah. Um, there was also another incident where, I wanna say this was uh, Faculty of Graduate Studies, or maybe it was also the Graduate Student Association as well, again, also at U of T, that sort of passed some sort of policy, some sort of bylaw that banned kosher food yeah. on campus. Yeah. It was U of T specifically. Food in their buildings. So mm -hmm. this sort of conflation and generalization of, um, you know, uh, Israeli policy to all Jews worldwide was definitely concerning and was definitely um, something that came up um, a couple of times, uh, but not about the law school hiring controversy, although yes. this might just be because we didn't speak to anybody at the law school. So it might be just that people weren't aware of what's happening there. Right. Also to be said, like, Every university, even even Ontario Tech, formerly known as UOIT, was in the news a number of years ago, mm -hmm. where the student union, in their infinite wisdom, decided to make a statement to say that they support the BDS movement on behalf of the university. And the university administration went, whoa, whoa, whoa. no, the university does not, the university, the UOIT does not. Uh, endorses and does not support the BDS movement. And uh, suffice to say, the president of that student union was not long lasting in that role. It was, it was, it was very sad for me being a student in and around that time. Uh, but at the same time also, I've heard some of the backstory since and it was a bit of a gong show, so to speak. It, it's definitely, I mean, I would say that no university that I've encountered um, in, in Canada is, is free of anti-Semitism. Um, at the same time, I would say that really no university is free of hate. Um, right. Teaching in the Faculty of Education at York University, um, within the first month of my tenure there, somebody left a swastika on a post-it note on my office door. Um, and it, it's brushed off because it is, we call that Monday. Um, I've been told to hide my, my mezuzah, which I always wear, but I said for my own safety, a colleague of mine said, you may want to tuck that into your shirt. This is the normalization. What leads to the point is it's never reported because I would say that growing up Jewish, this is normal. Um, and so, you know, we speak, when we look at those of the actual reported numbers, and you use the term microaggressions. I think that that's it. And, and whether we acknowledge and collectively accept Ira's definition of anti-Semitism or we continue to debate it, I think one of the big issues is the fact that anti-Semitism through its normalization is becoming more and more difficult to define. Um, and I mean, I think I posted on, on social media today, um, there's a, a piece going around the United States called Holocaust, right? The, the whole acknowledgement of COVID vaccines with the Jewish star being referred to as the Holocaust movement. And somebody in their infinite wisdom thinking that this was an, a very amusing play on words. Um, and so the, the piece I'm thinking about with my own students in the room here is you remove one body and apply it to another. So if we were to, it really, I guess, becomes the litmus test that if we say something of equal value to any of the isms I talked about prior, the, the anti-Black, the anti-Asian, the anti-Indigenous, would this still be acceptable? And I think the answer clearly is no. So 
as I guess as a parting thought to the participants, why is it okay against the Jews? Um, which then plays into that next, um, what's the next step? And, and it, it will be interesting to see. So as a final idea, I guess the question is, where can we read your study? When will it, if it isn't public yet, when will it be? And how can we all get a copy on it to really read it and, and try to understand is, you know, what I, I perceive as normal, is this in fact anti-Semitism? So the answer, the answer is the study will be in multiple publications. It is not yet. We okay. are currently on publication one of three, at, at least three that I can think of. Um, the first one we are wrapping up and should be put forward for publication in some, I, I forget, Irina, which of the journals we're applying to at this point, but one of the journals in Canada, and at that point, once it's available, I would assume it will be uh, linked to on our website, uh, on, on our various platforms and websites for, for people to read. Um, and so basically, the quantitative results will come out first, and then the qualitative results will come out after. Um, and then there will likely be some discussions about specific subgroups within our study. So I think we'll likely do at least something specifically targeting anti-Semitism on campus, something uh, likely talking about anti-Semitism specifically as related to anti-Israel attitudes. I think there's probably something to potentially be written about the experience of the study itself, a little yeah. bit of a reflection piece. So the likelihood is that a fair bit is going to be published in some way, shape or form uh, over the next while. I would also imagine, and this is something I'd probably need to talk to the team about, but um, that will we may develop some kind of white paper, um, something that wouldn't necessarily be as a journal article, but something that's more of a widely accessible report uh, to be posted sort of more publicly on our various websites and platforms uh, for people to access information. But again, as, as I mentioned earlier, I, I really think that this is a first step and this is the starting point. And hopefully, hopefully, in my opinion, the jumping off point to go from having zero academic, zero to minimal academic research on this issue to it being one that it is, is studied frequently and from different perspectives and has significant buy-in from uh, the Jewish community and from legislation, police, all, all of the necessary bodies to really attack this properly. Amazing. Well, thank you very much for making the time and for giving us an opportunity to reflect. There's no doubt that this learning is uncomfortable. That's, I think, the point. It's, it's a, exposing the fact that you know, there are some harsh realities and that we need to worry about how this is affecting, you know, education, our society and so on. And, you know, I, I know that we all look forward to the publication. There was one quick question, so maybe we'll, we'll leave it on this note. Can someone be anti-Semitic without being a racist? Or once you are an anti-Semite, are you clearly a racist? Um, is it okay if I take this question? Please. Um, so uh, I think it's a very interesting, very interesting discussion. And the thing that I would say is that, you know, hate is not exclusive, hate spreads, and it does so very quickly. And so I think that it's very difficult to um, disengage um, or to focus specifically on one group. I think that once, uh, you know, an individual is in that mindset that it becomes very easy for that hatred to spread to other groups. So um, I suppose in a technical sense, it might be possible, but I think it would be highly unlikely. Um, and I think that, you know, the target of their hatred um, changes. So I don't think it's necessarily that it's, um, I, I think it's more so that um, depending on what the political and social climate is at the time, that the target of that 
hatred changes. So with time, depending on the different uh, contexts in different locations, um, a hateful individual will still be a hateful individual and the message will still be one of hate and the target of that hate might change depending on the context and the time. I, I also, to, to add on to it, I, I'm unpacking the question and there are some interest. so the wordings, so where, where do you, and this goes back to the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, what do you define to be a Semite? Like if you're defining Semite based on the concept of race and ethnicity, then no, then the answer is if you are anti-Semitic, by the purest definition of that not going the IHRA, you are then likely a racist based on that. But also what are you defining to be a racist? Based on the current status of anti-Semitism, most of anti-Semitism I would think is more based on ethnicity and culture as well, ethnicity, culture, religion. So does the concept of racism encapsulate those uh, ideals of uh, ethnicity, culture, and religion. I, I would argue that it does, but I think that there's the concept of terminology of both anti-Semitism and racism itself. They are, racism is a relatively loaded concept and also I think easily overly generalizable. And this is me totally overly academic, uh, taking an academic approach to this, but that's, that's sort of my skirting around that issue. But I, I, I would say based on historical definitions of everything, then anti-Semitic and then therefore being racist because you are being against a uh, racial group of the Semites. But that being said, historically Semites include a much wider range of people. So a little bit more complicated of an answer. And I think Irina's answer was more in tune with what you were looking for. That being said, I, I think it's important to unpack some of the wording that was within that question. So, and I know um, people are afraid that anti-Semitism anti -Semitism might not truly encapsulate their feelings and people are starting to use the term anti-Jewish hate. Yeah. Plays into anti-Black racism, anti, you know, anti-2SLGBTQ plus hate because even that is not a race. Um, and so it, it's a great question, but it's not an easy answer. So given that, I wanna thank you very much. I'm, as an academic, I'm very excited to read the study cover to cover. Um, I may be one of few people that love academic studies and looking at the numbers, but I think it exposes a lot. And, and you, know, you mentioned the white paper, so I'd be interested to read those. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the time, the learning and the difficult conversations. Um, on that, I'm a reminder to here that we will be posting this video public in the next coming weeks. Um, if you do have any further questions that you'd like me to ask either Dr. Stein or um, Irina Levitt, and I know that will soon be Dr. Levitt because I have the utmost faith. Five years. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Um, this is an exciting study, and hopefully, I, we know that change is slow but hopefully we're in the right direction. So thank you very much. And all of you have a wonderful, wonderful evening. Be safe and be well. Take thank care. Thank you very much for having us. You're welcome. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you.